Well, hello there, it's Antrice, and welcome to another episode of the Savvy Painter Podcast. This episode is sponsored by Trakel Art Supplies. For over 30 years, Trakel has been obsessed with the art of brush making, and now they're applying that same obsession to professional grade artist panels. Both their brushes and panels are made right here in California at their Hesperia factory. Go to Trakel.com and use promo code SAVVY16 to get 15% off your next order. My guest this week is Jennifer Pochinski. Jennifer uses the figure as a vehicle to play with texture, paint, color, and wide open spaces. She incorporates abstraction, expressive brush strokes, and gestures into her work. For Jennifer, the subject is almost incidental. Although she loves the figure, her paintings could just as easily be about anything, as long as she can play with the medium. Jennifer studied painting at the University of Hawaii. It was there that she realized her preconceived idea that artists had to draw or paint perfectly wasn't quite right. Exposure to early 20th century artists like Picasso and Matisse changed her perspective and started her along a new trajectory. In this episode, Jennifer and I talk about how she uses Instagram for inspiration, how she keeps moving when it seems like a painting she's so invested in might not work out. That leads us into a conversation about how she deals with the paintings that she's not quite satisfied with. I love to hear about the daily rituals of artists. Jennifer shares how her daily habits have evolved over the years and how she managed to keep painting as a single mother. Then we got into how she prepares for her painting day, including a segue into a very detailed explanation of how she uses her painting jars. I was really curious about this part, so Jennifer completely indulged me. Here is Jennifer Pochinski. Jennifer, thank you so much for being on the podcast with me. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me today. Thanks for having me. Can you tell me a little bit about your background and how you started off as an artist, like when you decided that this was the vocation that you were going to pursue? I think it was probably when I was in college, I was going to study languages, German or Spanish. And I took an art course and my teacher suggested I major in art. And as the semesters went on, I, you know, I was totally devoted to it. I realized it was my mission in life. I mean, I never dared to call myself an artist. You know what I mean? Because I, yeah, but it was a pursuit, you know? Yeah, it was something that really called to you and, and made you feel like, yeah, this is home almost. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So before that, were there any artists that you particularly looked at that sort of inspired you? Or did you get into those classes and start painting and think, wow, this is great? I went to University of Hawaii and the beginning classes were really kind of focusing on early 20th century. And, you know, I loved it because in high school, I was really into art and everything, but I always thought an artist was someone who could draw really perfect and had like these perfect linear paintings. And when I saw the early 20th century stuff, you know, I was like, okay, I can try to tackle this. Or, you know, I could, I could relate to that approach, you know. Who were some of the artists that you were looking at during that time? It was the post-impressionists, Picasso, Matisse. It was really the whole range of um, the early 20th century. I wasn't really aware of what was happening after 1950 because, you know, I took an art history class and I took the first half of the 20th century and I didn't take the second half of the 20th century. So for some reason, I just, I stayed there. Mm -hmm. I mean, now I, I'm so much more aware of so many more artists that I can say have influenced me. Yeah, I would love to hear a little bit about your work and some of the some of your approaches for it. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, for example, how you choose a motif or how you decide what you're going to paint? What is it that pulls you in and, and draws you to a particular subject matter? I love the figure. Even in school, I was never the, the one that would, you know, stand up in the critiques and talk a lot. I, I would just say it is what it is, you know, and kind of felt like I was on this journey. It's like, you know, you can't judge me by this. You know, this is just one painting of many, many that I'm supposed to make. So I never could sort of totally encapsulate my approach, you know, and I can't now I'm just, I'm just digging, you know, but I love the figure. I love texture. I love paint. You know, my work is really about the paint. It can, I can paint like a roll of tape or 
a face and it's, I try to use the same approach. Uh I love lots of activity and visual texture and stuff and big, wide open, empty spaces. I just feel like I'm just filling in space. So I was doing a lot of these tabletop images and cutting off the faces and maybe having some arms. And then in the springtime, I remember I was like sick, which I never, I I never get sick, but I was sick one day and about, you know, 11 o'clock I got out of bed. I kept looking out the window to my studio and I, I said, I'm just going to do a table scene. And I ended up doing the faces and it was on this old crappy canvas and the texture was awful. But I was (laughs) like, what happened? Like the faces are, you know, the faces all of a sudden were way more interesting. So I started showing more of the face. And then as the summer progressed, I just stopped doing the tables. I was really tired of them. And um, I work from photos from Instagram now for the most part. So I was like seeking out all these interesting, you know, just sort of like women sitting and doing the Instagram kind of stuff. And, uh-huh. But I've started really focusing on the figure since I moved to California almost exactly six years ago. And it's just more interesting to me. So that's interesting that you, you're you now pulling work off of pulling your inspiration from Instagram. I'm kind of curious if there's any, I'm trying to figure out how to ask this, like I'm formulating the question in my mind as we're doing this. But I think Instagram and and social media has kind of, you know, and I've talked about this before on the podcast, but they sort of give us these interesting new visions into into people's lives, you know, like nothing, like depending on the on the person, of course, you just have all these little windows into people's life, just these quick glimpses. So I'm kind of curious about how you how you started doing that and what sparks you when you see a particular photo on Instagram. Like, are they people that you know? Is it just random shots that you're just like, oh, there's something about that that I want to adapt into my own work? Yeah, I just sort of do a hashtag, you know, of a well, I, I use Taverna, you know, like a Greek Taverna, because the Greeks just have these amazing tables and feasts and stuff. And then, you, you know, you go, it's just surfing, basically, you go on a string, you know, you find yourself all over the world, it's kind of funny. But yeah, it's just something that grabs me. I mean, gosh, I had to, you know, you have to weep through people sticking out their tongues, flipping off the camera. Yeah. You know, that was really typical. Like, it's like, why do you have to do a weird face when someone's taking your picture? I, I mean, <laughs> it's just the culture, it's youth, I don't know. So it's mostly something like exactly like you said, it's something that strikes me and it's something kind of natural about it too, or something beautiful or, and there's so many pictures that I would, you know, it's like, oh, if they had only been wearing, or I don't know, hadn't cut off their legs or, you know, something like that. Right. Or like if this color and this color were next to each other, then yeah. During the summer when I, you know, I started doing this in the spring, you know, usually in the summer it's kind of laid back. I was like, looking constantly and my fingers would kind of like from my nerves just constantly scrolling and scrolling you know (laughs) yeah like muscles that don't usually get used are getting tired (laughs) you know I sometimes I was like I'd look up at the clock and it's like an hour went by I didn't find anything and your eyes are spinning and then I'd be in bed at night looking at my phone and because also I was trying to develop like this narrative, like, what is this really about? You know, is it about selfies? What is it about? And, you know, I would do a painting and it seemed like it would go off on a tangent, like it would take the whole narrative somewhere else. And, and then, you know, then I'd be in despair for a few days because nothing was working. And then I would just try anything. Then I'd be like, oh, okay, now it's making sense. It's, it's, it's fleshing out or whatever. I don't know. It's hard to explain. Nobody who's not a painter would believe how stressful it is or how, you know, you're so invested in this and and working out or I am. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like most people think that painters don't have stress and not the lay people. Yeah. I think, well, I think artists know different. I think the people who listen to this show, you know, probably are going, are like nodding their heads right now and going, yes. Oh my God. Yes. But yeah, I think there's this myth of the artist who sort of waltzes into the studio and is struck by a bolt of inspiration and is, you know, like dancing around doing their painting. And then all of a sudden they have their masterpiece and then they have a glass of wine or whatever. And then they go off to a 
a cafe or a bar and they talk about philosophy or something we do, you know, I mean, that's like obviously an, an extreme and going out, going way out on it. But, but I, I think it's true. I think like there's this mysticism around artists that's part fantasy and part almost like shamans or something like that, where they look at artists as, as like these people that have a different vision that they just completely don't understand and are somehow visited by something else that is just kind of like, whoa, I don't know how you do that. But, you know, and so then there's this fantasy of how it gets done. And (laughs) which has just usually does not take into account that there is hours and hours and hours and decades of work that goes into it that gets and it's not usually this bolt of lightning. Yes, very true. <laughs> your your process or the process that you're working with right now just really remind I don't know why this is reminding me of it. But you know, before we were all just locked into our cell phones and just constantly looking down at our, our phones. Like I just remember I lived in this neighborhood that had all these sort of Spanish style houses, and they all had big giant windows in the front that usually their living rooms and or off to their kitchen. So if you you know, like I would go for a walk at night, And you would just catch all these glimpses of people's lives, you know, these brief moments in time. And what you're doing, somehow it recalls that for me. Like, it just reminds me of that idea of walking down a street and just getting these random glimpses into a person's life. Yeah, I mean, I I guess we're all sort of willingly, you know, doing that, you know, just putting ourselves out there. It's interesting, you know, it's, it's just amazing you know, how we live now. It really is. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, given how how you're working, what memorable responses have you had to your work? Is there anything that kind of stands out as something that was either unexpected or kind of touching to you in how somebody looked at your work and what they saw in it? Well, I I get surprised. You know, I'm usually painting and um, I don't really have a lot of contact with well, besides social media, you know, with people that I don't know responding to my work. But, you know, like at openings, people talk to you. All that part, it feels so far removed from what I'm actually doing. I mean, I've, I've been really super happy when someone, quote unquote, important responds to my work, you know, someone that noticed my work, I, you know, I'm really happy. But one thing that really touched me was I had a, a painting in the Paris Review in the summer. It was just a painting of the swimming, these people in a pool. And someone told me that when they saw it, she was a stranger. She said that she practically burst into tears when she saw it. And it's not even a, there's nothing sentimental about it. But I, I just thought, wow, you know what, it, you know what it is, is that I feel like you know, music is so moving and it can get you out of your mood. It can help you when there's a death. Yes. And I really think I enjoy painting them more than people having them on their walls. You know what I mean? So I think, I, I don't know. I always think, okay, if I went to jail and I hear, had to hear the same song over and over, that would drive me crazy. <laughs> but if I had a painting on the wall, I, I probably could, it would occupy me. I'd be looking at it, all, you know, and you, you know how you find new things. So on one hand, I, I can understand how paintings are moving and whatnot. But on the other hand, I, I, I kind of, I don't know, I think I enjoy painting them than they bring to other people. So I, or I, you know, I know, I think I know what you mean. It's sometimes it feels like almost a selfish act, like that you get to you know, that we get to do this, that we get to, I don't know, it's just so kind of endlessly fascinating and challenging at the same time. And so it's, I'm so grateful that we get to do this, you know, that, you know, huge part of it is the choices that we make. And there's so much joy in it and so much challenge in it that it almost feels selfish sometimes. And then when you put it out and people see it, then it's just kind of like, not to be dismissive of it, but it's kind of like, yeah, okay, but you're already on to the next thing. And so. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's the funny thing about openings is, you know, you have the work up and everything and people are like, oh, you know, whatever. I like your work. And then you're just, you're like, oh, yeah, that was last year. <laughs> or, you know, I'm trying to do something new. It's, I know what you mean, because it's a weird feeling, because it's, you totally appreciate the fact that they're you're responding to your work. But because, I mean, I don't know, you can tell me, I don't know about you, but if I'm working on something, even if I'm out 
having dinner with somebody else, sometimes that painting is in the back of my head, and I'm just like totally focused on it. So when you're standing there looking at your work, I don't know, do you feel like, like your painting, you know, each painting seems to be in general, sort of a step towards the next one. And so when you see like a year's body of work, and you're looking at that, like, it just makes me want to go back to my studio and paint. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, you know, so many paintings that people like, I just cringe over. I mean, like I had a painting, I did it not this past summer, the summer before, and I was sort of building my studio. So I had my painting just propped up everywhere. And I would walk into the house and see this one painting out of the corner of my eye and go, yeah, I got to script that off. Gotta, you know, and then I sent a bunch of images to, to my gallery and I just threw that one in just for bulk, just for, for to have them have more things to reject. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I mean, like, it was, you know, 14 things and here's one, you know, that you'll probably reject. Anyways, <laughs> it's sold so fast. And, you know, and it's like, oh, my God, that lives in the world now, you know. And I just try to keep my mouth shut because I'm not going to say, oh, no, no, that's an awful painting, you know, publicly. But it's just funny how that works. Have you ever thought to yourself that there is a painting that, you know, like you felt that way about it, that you didn't really like it? And then later on, you're like, oh, wait, I, I can see more of what I was thinking then. Yeah, I scrape off a lot of work. I was going through some images one day and I, I had this really tough year of painting as 2014 I was trying everything you know and I I did this like figure and then these like in the foreground and a couple of figures in the background and like a big pool or something and I, that painting is long gone and then I, I kind of clicked it I'm like oh this isn't half bad and I was thinking oh I got rid of it and then you know it's like well that's okay I guess and now I look at it and I have it on my desktop for some reason it's gone. I'm glad it's gone. You know, that kind of, whatever you got rid of it, it comes back to you anyways. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like, so you'll, you'll find it again down the road. And I built my studio and then I just put up this little structure and I just recently moved a bunch of paintings to clear up some space in there. And there's some things like, I see things that I think are awful now. And I thought, oh my God, I thought this was so fantastic. So it goes both ways, I think, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I think that that's the wonderful thing about painting is that, you know, I mean, it's painful to see, <laughs> to see works that like, really, I thought that was so great. Oh, my God, it's awful. But it just kind of shows how you've grown from it, I think. Well, you look at early works of that were kind of awkward. Like there was a big um, Bonar show here in in California, uh -huh. in San Francisco. And you could kind of see there's a section of the, these bigger paintings. It just kind of looked like he was trying to do stuff. And it, it wasn't as successful as like his smaller works. And, and I, you know, or you go into a, a show and you think, I wonder if they would rolling in their graves if they knew we were looking <laughs> at this stuff. You know what I mean? But I love it because it's like, okay, they were human too, you know? Yeah. I just cringe over so many things, but I don't know. There's a couple that I'm real, that I'll stand by. <laughs> <laughs> do you, do you have paintings, for example, that, well, I guess, actually, let me go, I want to go back to that, if, if you don't mind. I'm just curious, that sense of not being fully satisfied with your work. Do you feel like for you that that's, is, is sort of an incentive to push harder? Or is it, do, do you feel like it pulls you back at times? I definitely pushes me harder because you know you just you, you we all know that feeling you just wake up i mean you wake up and you just try it again i mean we there's so many quotes about that you know it's just one of life's reminders <laughs> you know it's just all repetition we're just trying our best every single day this episode is sponsored by Trakel art supplies Hi, I'm Sean Cheatham, and I'm part of the Turkel Pro team. You may remember Sean from an interview last year on the podcast. He's a California artist who paints just these gorgeous portraits and figurative works. So aside from the quality of their brushes, I asked Sean what else stands out about Turkel Art Supplies. I love that they're made in California. That's, to me, something that's nice. You just If you order it through their website, they're such a small company that they're very personable. And, and you may end up, if you call, you'll be talking to Courtney, maybe, or whoever. And 
the brushes will show up very quickly. Sean teaches workshops in Rome every summer. And last year, he needed supplies from Trapel. They're making it easy for people. And they ship internationally. When they ship to Rome, I had a big shipment, and it was, like, pretty quick. So what stands out about Trapel art supplies? Made locally, more affordable, and more durable. I mean, you can't, can't really beat that. And I don't, I'm not just saying that because I'm on the pro team. I was enjoying them before that. It's funny, too, because now I actually take better care of my brushes. When I used to use the other brands, I would actually just treat them like disposable brushes. And every time I went to a store, I'd just buy a few brushes because I knew I was just going to beat them up and start new ones every time. But I don't do that anymore. Kind of weird how that happens. Go to Trakel.com and use promo code SAVVY16 to get 15% off your next order. I'm also curious, I love asking this question, I think a lot, you know, because I know a lot of people are are interested in it and something I'm just fascinated by. But I'm curious, do you have sort of a ritual for how you start your work or, you know, like habits that you that you consistently do when you go into your studio in the morning or like how you structure your day? Well, I'm consistent about um, when I paint because I've been raising my kids by myself for 12 and a half years. Well, my older daughter is turning 20 and my younger daughter just turned 16. So I kind of had to work around their schedule. So I'm a more, you know, I paint early morning, 730, you know, try to finish, you know, during the school year by three. Mm -hmm. Um, But in the summer, I can kind of pass summer, especially I I was going back in the studio in the evening. You know, I, I used to be because I was a, you know, single parent and I don't have a lot of time, you know, I, I tried to be super ready, like knew what I was going to paint that day and what I was going to work on and not kind of come in and kind of scratch my head and kind of look around and stuff. Yeah. But, you know, just kind of be like, get in, start painting, you know, so you can get everything done by the time I, ha- I you know, had, I would have you to have a deadline. Them. You have a daily deadline yeah. pretty much. Now my daughter, I have one daughter at home. She rides her bike at school. So my driving time is like zero. So <laughs> that's great. It's gotten a lot easier. Yeah. But a lot of t- the times, you know, not having a big plan can kind of work for you too, because something happens that you didn't expect. So but usually I'm pretty prepared. I'm going to dig into the details with you if you don't mind. Like, how do you, <laughs> how do you prepare? What do you do to make sure that when you walk, in, you know, on those days that you re- feel like you really need to like just hit the ground running? What do you do the day before to prepare your your studio or your rough, you know, like all of the above, like your 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 actual painting space, and then maybe reference or whatever? I change my thinner. They told us that, you know, to have three jars of kind of cleanish thinner, so you can kind of dip, I you know, paint in oil. So um, you dip it, you know, into three different jars. I've actually never heard this. Oh, um, a, a gambling rep um, told us that. And it's actually really great because I would find that the dirty thinner would kind of, I'd make a mark and I, you know. Yeah. It, you know, gets murky and stuff. And then you go. Sorry, I'm going to, I'm going to yeah. totally geek out with you on this. <laughs> These are the conversations that you can't have with anybody else except for another painter, right? Everybody else would be like, oh, you clean your brushes. Great. Okay. Anyway, so you have three jars and as you're painting, you're doing this or is this the end of the day? You have three jars and supposedly the first jar is the dirtiest jar because you're, that's the jar you deep brush in first and then yeah. second, third. I'm never, I'm not in the right order when I do it, but having three jars is it's, there's a dirtiest middle and then the cleanest jar. It makes sense. Cause the first jar you're getting like all the, like the gook out. And then the second one, you're sort of rinsing it. And then the third one, it's basically clean. Yeah. And you know, when you come in to paint in the morning, like you, I have some empty jars and I, I have like one little clean empty jar and I pour off the clean, you know how it settles at the bottom. Mm-hmm. So I pour the clean one into that one. Then I empty that jar and then I do that to all three jars. And so you have like this, um, you just have the top layer. Yeah. So, and you have this like constant rotation. Of- yeah. And so you waste a lot less, I think. And then you have, then you have like these extra jars that have, that you throw the really thick gucky stuff and then they start settling. And so you have that clean stuff too. So by the end, you just, I have like jars of, that's just like gray paint basically it's like really thin paint but but it's solid you know what I mean yeah yeah 
And I used to actually do try to do paintings with it. And <laughs> but I found, you know, and I've done I, I used to add that to a lot of my paintings, actually like the landscapes. As like a muddy gray or something, just to Yeah. Well, I like that on my palette anyway, so you use that. But um I thought, oh, this is just a great way to use up this paint in but I found that it, I ended up using a lot of paint to try to, try to tint it. But I, on the palette, I like that gray stuff because it's it's just a good base, you know, for everything. That makes sense. Okay, sorry, I had to like dig down into the day. Like, can't believe she's sitting here asking me about my paint jars. <laughs> no, I love talking about that. <laughs> <laughs> so the night before, you get all those set and ready, and then what else do you do to prepare for for your painting day? Like, so that you can just well, I kind of you know, I, I my studio is in my yard, so I always take pictures of my work. And then if I'm taking a walk in the park, um, which I pretty much do every day, I'll like look at my painting and, and I come in here all the time. So I actually, I have like a little loft that has a bed. So anyway, I've been sleeping in here. So at night, like I'm like on Netflix staring at my paintings and, you know, (laughs) so yeah, I'm like you, I'm always sort of, it's always sort of at the back of my mind and it's kind of like a, an anchor for me. You know, it's just kind of a, it's, it's kind of comforting to always, it feels less empty. I don't know. it feels makes life feel less superficial, you know, because you have something very important, you know, at the back of your mind. But anyway, so I look and then um, I go through Instagram constantly. I'm cropping photos. But a lot of times, like if I have this big plan, like because now I'm doing these panels that are there are sections of in- photographs. And then I'm trying to make like this big scenario. And are they I, all from unrelated Instagram photos? Yeah. Um, like I did a, a, a cr- crowd scene. Well, one the first one I did was just one big picture of these, this crowd watching soccer. So now, so now I'm trying to do these unrelated scenes and try to mash them together. So, um, you know, I have like these grand ideas about what's going to happen and it doesn't work. So I try to have some sort of backup and, or that I'm, if not, then I'm just sitting and trying anything, you know. What do you do when you feel like you're stuck on a painting? Like if you're working on something, it's the middle of the day of your work day and you're, just like, oh, I don't know what to do with this. Are you switching back and forth between different paintings? Or are you like the kind of, I'm going to sit here and stare at it until it tells me what to do? <laughs> I think that's when you really need to just like get out and take a walk or go wash the dishes or something, you know, because you're just trying to force it. Every painter knows it. And I don't mean to sound like a I'm saying something revolutionary. So yeah, I'm the type that just get out of there. I do have for these one, the the bigger ones, I have two or, well, I have two at the moment that I'm working on, but um, I'll just get out. You know, I I, I have to leave. So yeah, I I find also that doing the dishes or doing some like doing laundry. I don't know. There's something about like, if I'm getting to the point where, you know, like I would call it getting to the point of diminishing returns where sometimes sticking with it and kind of pushing your way through the block is a good thing. A lot of times it's just an exercise in frustration and, (laughs) and like whatever, where you're just like, I'm not getting anything done. Or, you know, for me, it's, I realize, you know, where where I kind of draw that line is if I'm staring at the po- painting and I am deconstructing it or actively thinking about things to change it or do it or kind of mentally going through the painting, then I'm fine with just sitting there. But the minute I start thinking about anything else, like if my mind starts to wander about <laughs> whatever is on my list of things to do or what, or, you know, something like that, then I find that going and do something that, that's like a quick, easy win. Like, I don't know how to explain it. But like, it's kind of like your brain is is trying to solve these little problems, right? And it gets frustrating if you're just sitting there and your wheels are spinning and you're not solving anything. And so going and doing the dishes is like a really quick, brainless, easy win. Like, I, like it sounds totally bizarre, but it's like, there's a pile of dishes and the goal is to get them clean. And I don't have to think about, you know what I mean? Like, there's just you, you're kind of chaining together these small, stupid successes of cleaning the dishes. And so then when I get back, it's like my brain is sort of reset, and I can get back to it. It sounds ridiculous, but it totally works. Like doing 
dishes, going for doing the laundry, or going even better, going for a walk, like you said, and just breathing and escaping and allowing your subconscious to get to work. Yeah, um, I heard a, an interview on Fresh Air about that company, 3M. I think they offer their employees one hour a day to do absolutely nothing and even like taking a nap or, you know, not just a lunch break because they understand that that's how a, a creative mind works. It has to be relaxed. Yeah. But you're right. I think there is a, sometimes it is better to push through because if, if you're always like, oh, well, that didn't work. I'll go do the dishes. Then you may not break through that thing, you know? Right. You're right. It, it's both. It's, it's, you know. Yeah. And I don't, I don't know what it, I mean, I don't like that. Like, so that's the line that I draw is when the mind starts to, to wander, like, because I feel like I need something to kind of hang my coat on because otherwise kind of like you're alluding to you, you train yourself to just give up every time you reach a struggle and then you'll never get to those exciting places. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We live in this funny existence. It's like so exciting and so fulfilling and, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just curious, how do you keep your creative spark? Like, what is it about painting that keeps you fascinated if we haven't already talked about that? Like, I've, I feel like you're, like you've alluded to some things before, but like just as a direct question, what keeps you, so, you know, so fascinated with this? Well, I think it's need. You know, painting has just been always like this thing that is like a stronghold you know what I mean like you know it was when I was in this horrible marriage it's like the the one little thing I could control and um then you know divorce it you know all that stuff so it, instead of feeling nervous you know some I remember you know when I used to feel nervous and like upset that I, it felt better to to have painted or to be done and and stuff and nothing ever came out the way I wanted it to you know, there was that, you know, there was a lot of fear. And then it just became this thing that I have to do. You know what I mean? Even mm -hmm. when I was, when my kids were really little, it was just like, uh, I just need to paint two hours a day. Then I can be their slave. I can drive them places. I can be the super mom, but I just need that, you know? Yeah. And now it's like, there's nothing else that I want to do, you know, besides maybe go look at art, but I don't want to, I'd rather paint. Like you said something about Oh, going to, you know, being at your opening or whatever, it makes you want to turn around and go and paint. You know, sometimes looking at art makes you want to do that too. So, you know, it's just the thing that I, it's the only thing that I really want to do. You know, I don't like to do a lot of stuff. It's a, it's absolutely like, I totally understand that, that it's, it's a refuge. And it's like, like, I have to say, with all of the evolutions of my life, it has been the one constant always, like since I was a little kid, up until now, um, like I remember, you know, like my parents got divorced and, and when, when, you know, some of that chaos was happening, my refuge was my paper and my pencils and, you know, sitting on the floor in my room and drawing. And, and I think I've carried that with me that it is the one thing that will never, ever change and will always sort of be there. I, I can totally understand that. Yeah. Do you mind if I ask you, because I know a lot of this, it's a huge, huge topic that I, I don't, honestly, I don't think can be talked about <laughs> enough. And I don't have kids, so I'm not the person to talk about it. But um, I know a lot of artists really struggle with how to maintain their painting practice with kids, especially small kids, like great, you know, like toddlers in grade school, um, when they need the most attention. And since you're you're kind of on the other side of that, you know, you've got a 16 year old and a 20 year old, and I'm imagining they're pretty self sufficient by now, by now. You know, clearly they they need your attention and they want your attention. But like when they were at that younger age, how did you how did you deal with that? How did you make sure that you got your painting those two hours in? Well, when my older daughter was about three, I was doing the whole in the mom's group, and you know all that stuff. And I came home from a trip and I went to back to Hawaii to visit my parents and stuff. And within a week I had like four play dates, you know, mom's calling me up cause I was always a homebody. And I just thought, what am I doing? You know, like, why am I, it's a, why am I like, this is my life babysitting other people's kids. You know, I should be painting. I don't want to like be old and then wake up and say, I should have been painting, you know? So I just decided that my life wasn't going to be like that anymore. And so my daughter had her friend, she had one 
really good friend. And I just started painting. And she, I just remember her riding around in a little car around me as I was painting. You know, I wasn't doing any amazing. I was just doing little whatever I could. You know what I mean? So um, I made that decision. But the, one of the best things is we moved to Greece when I, when my daughter, my younger daughter was two. So they were about two and six. And there, I, I'm sure as you know, you know, life outside of America is that there's no play dates and it, it's like the kids play in the streets, you know? Yeah. And er, the kids were in our yard. We had this big yard. So in my, I had like a little studio that was kind of outdoorish. So I, I could paint. They were there. My older daughter's four years older than my younger one. She kept an eye on her and they were happy. Everyone was happy, you know, and, you know, like during in the summer, in the winter, you know, they had school. I think my, my younger daughter started preschool, you know, after maybe a year or two after just do what you can, you know? Yeah. So you so you're pretty much, I mean, you know, allowing them to play around you and allowing that and making that part of, I don't know if it's part of your process, but just saying like, okay, I'm, I'm doing this anyway. And, and they can, they don't have to be mutually exclusive. And yeah, school. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you know, the first day of school is always so great. But the first day of summer is always so great, too. It's just kind of funny. You know, back then, I wasn't, you know, I paint much longer now. I don't think I could have like a little kid right now. You know, I think it would be really difficult because I'm, I, I just feel like I, I need more concentration. You know, I was just sort of doing like a simple exercise back then. You know, it was a lot of practice, basically, I think, you know. But yeah, I mean, that's a I mean, I think that's a great, great way to to look at it. And it is a period of time. It's a it's a sort of like a an era in your life. And that's, that's a part of it. Like that's a factor that you incorporate into your painting practice. So, you know, to design it so that you have these one hour or half hour or whatever it is, painting practices or structures or whatever to like, okay, I can do this. That doesn't require a lot of thought, because if you have a toddler, you're going to be interrupted constantly. But it sounds like you just really either consciously or unconsciously sort of managed your expectations about what you were going to be able to get done during that time. But then also were really diligent about making sure that you didn't just stop painting. Yeah, you know, I, I think it's being a mom and an artist is very compatible. And the kids have you there at home. And I, I, I always thought it was pretty compatible. And you know, they like to get in there and you know, paint, you know, whether they're going to be artists in the future or not, it's, it's such, it's so great for them, you know. So all my dishes have a little bit of paint, you know, I, I paint with gloves, but, but somehow, you know, paint gets on everything. So it's like, okay, they, I, they have to eat something for lunch. Like you just take your gloves off and go put something together for them. And right. you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> the refrigerator's a little, got some paint on it. <laughs> I think almost everything in my house, I, and I don't know how it gets there. Like I, I'm, you, sounds like you're the same way, but I try to be so careful. And then I'll see paint on. I'm like, really? How? That's like four steps removed from. <laughs> like, how is that even possible? <laughs> but it happens. I'm curious. So now that your daughters are, are 16 and 20, do either of them have show any interest in art? Well, they're both really good. My older daughter is very talented, and she went through sort of a hard freshman year of college, and she was drawing a lot. But she's not planning on majoring in art. She's just one of those people that knows how to go out and get what she wants in this world. And I don't think that's what an artist is. I think we don't know what how to get what we want, so we sort of create, you know, our own world or whatever. <laughs> that's interesting. You know, and she's very she, – I admire her so much. But um, my younger daughter is, she's planning on going to call it like an art college, design college or whatever. And so she's a sophomore. So she's into photography. She's into, she found a, an old camera with that uses 35 millimeter film. She's really into that. And so we're just constantly developing film and stuff. It's really cool. <laughs> so I think she'll be an artist. Uh, you know, she's, who knows? I sound like... <laughs> I don't know. I, I guess every mom and artist expect, you know, <laughs> we're so proud. We're proud. 
Of course you're proud. I mean, I think it's so exciting, though, to see, you know, like, there's been a couple artists that I've talked to, and they're like, Oh, my God, my daughter, you know, because you don't want to push it on them. And then there's that moment where it's like, I caught her drawing. And there's like so much excitement in it, you know, because it's kind of like this, like, okay, I'm not going to push you to do it. But how amazing is it that you're doing? <laughs> I know, I know. I, I always thought it was great. You know, they were always drawing. And, um, you know, I've never thrown away any of their drawings. You know, like I couldn't, it's like, you know, letting the flag touch the ground or, you know, like something so sacred, you cannot throw that away. But I just thought it was good for their brains and stuff. But my, my younger daughter is very linear. Like she does like these really delicate, amazing drawings. And um, a couple of times she's like had projects that she had to do something on her iPad. And I, I'm like, I, I, you know, we were like in the morning in Russia. I'm like, oh, I can kind of help you. And I, you know, I'm so like messy and I ruined her things. And I feel so horrible, you know. <laughs> do you ever find that looking at, you know, like, so... Over the years, I'm sure you have, you know, like, like you said, that you keep all these drawings. Do you ever look at their drawings and see something in their drawings that you then incorporate into your own work? No, I don't. But when they were little, they would do like these paintings. And at that time, I was trying to do like abstract paintings. And I would be like, why can't I just do this? You know, like, because I'm just not meant to be an abstract painter. But you know what I mean? They, It's just there's a freedom. Yeah. And like this unpredictability and stuff, but that's interesting. So, last question, and I'll and I'll let you get back to your. <laughs> um, but if you could own a piece of art by any artist, what would it be, or or whose? Gosh, I would take anything. It's like a, I wouldn't turn down any um, great um, piece. But um, right now, I'm looking at Kitai. You know, I found a book of his um, in a bookstore, and I know that I just missed a show in Los Angeles that has the London School. So it had um, Auerbach and Freud, I guess. And, you know, I, I kind of thought I had this fantasy of just flying there for a few hours and seeing it and coming back. I just couldn't afford it. But so I would love to see one of those. And if I could have it, that would be even better. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Like I must, I'm just thinking right now because you mentioned that thing of, um, you know, if you were like in jail or trapped somewhere and you had to listen to the same song over and over and over again, you would go nuts. But if there was a painting that you had to look at over and over again, you would just, it would maintain your fascination. It makes me kind of want to change that question to like, if you were stuck in a room, <laughs> what painting would you want to be stuck in a room with? <laughs> Well, then definitely Kitai because there's so much going on in the painting. You know, you try to look at his steps and how he got to that point. It's just a total mystery. But I guess any painting, you know, just about any painting would be kind of great in jail. Even like those horrible ones you find at like antique stores or something, you know, <laughs> you could still get something out of it, I think. Yeah. Um, like if it was like some old shed or, you know what I mean? So, you know, it'd be a window. Yeah, something to spark your imagination. Yeah. Jennifer, thank you so much for talking with me and, and taking the time to out of your out of your studio time to share your thoughts on painting. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it too. Well, I hope you enjoyed that interview with Jennifer Pochinski. Thank you again to Jennifer for being so generous with her time. Go to SavvyPainter.com and click on the podcast link. You'll find the show notes for this episode there. Jennifer's paintings are there, along with links to everything that we talked about in this episode. If you've been listening to this podcast or you're subscribed to the mailing list, you know that I've been working on a special program for you that is coming up very soon. It's an ongoing membership program for artists that will help you get your work out, find collectors, and expand your network. I'm designing this to show you the small baby steps that, when done consistently, add up to giant leaps in your studio and business. If you want more information, you can put yourself on the early bird list at SavvyPainter.com forward slash early bird. As I get closer to the launch date, you will be the first to know and you will be eligible for the lowest possible price. So if you want to be part of that exclusive group, again, it's SavvyPainter.com forward slash early bird. Next up on the podcast will be Karen Kanyer. So until next week, this is Antrice Wood with the Savvy Painter Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>